Good morning and welcome. Praise God. I just wanted to open with scripture this morning. Psalm 27, verse 4. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle will I sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hallelujah. Join with me in entering into praise this morning for the, the God who loves us so much that he sent his son to give his life that we might have life. <clears throat> this first song is about the house of the Lord and singing and praising and shouting for joy. Hallelujah.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. If you need a way maker this morning. I know I do. Stop working. You 
Jesus, Jesus. We serve a good and loving God. Thank you. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin had left a crib.
Thank no you, condemnation. Thank you, God. We feel enough of that in the world around us, right? Yeah. The cancel culture, the cancel culture that sometimes, sometimes it's our neighbor on the left or our neighbor on the right or the person that's checking us out, whatever. Sometimes friends on Facebook will cancel us. But uh, there is no condemnation in Christ. He paid it all. He washed us clean. And uh, at least in his sight, we are free, free indeed. Amen? Amen. Amen. I want you to be seated for a minute. Um, we have several recognitions, I think, today. Um, for one thing, and we haven't figured out the whole graduation thing, here's what we're trying to do with graduations, right? We're trying to get everybody here at the right at the same time. So how stupid is that? But we're really still trying. Uh, but we have, I think we have a couple high school grads with us today. Uh, Jake, would you stand? <laughs> your high school grad, right? Our, your high school grad, would you stand up and yes. say hello? <laughs> so uh, make sure that you slip them a, you know, a $50 bill today. <laughs> Yeah, and then we won't have to do anything. I mean, it will all have to be... No, just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, so we congratulate them on a, that, that first milestone. And uh, since all of them have gotten into Harvard, we, uh, we'll be doing that in another four years. <laughs> just, just kidding. Uh, here's another joke. Could you come forward, please? I uh, want to... I don't have a microphone for you. No, no, we need to... Yeah, God's not going to help you at this point, Jacob, so <laughs> don't need to cry out to God at this point. It's already done deal. So introduce yourself and tell us why in the world you're here on Sundays occasionally. I'm Jacob Michael Card. Um, I'm here, I started coming here a couple months ago um, with my girlfriend's family. Um, when I was little, I used to go down the wrong path, and as soon as like I met my girlfriend, um, they like all came together and like started bringing me to the right path and like start to like choose God. That's why I'm here every Sunday. Glory. Okay. So, uh, but we're only renting you for a little while, right? What's happening next? Um, today's going to be my last day at this service. Um, I am part of the United States Navy. Um, And when do you uh, head off to, uh, you go to basic, is that right? Yeah. When do you do that? Um, I'm leaving next week, Tuesday, June 21st, and I'm heading off to Chicago, Illinois for two months. Okay. So we're going to pray for Jake. You go by Jacob or Jake? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter? So we'll just call you Bill. <laughs> so I want all the vets to come join us and the board as well, and uh Get behind Jacob, and uh, let's pray for this young man. God will strengthen him. He's got a bit of a road ahead of him. Amen. Don't you think your girlfriend ought to come up here too? Yeah. Is that okay? Okay. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in the hearts of people that, uh, that become curious, Lord, and then decide for you. I thank you for this young man who stands before us today, but more importantly, that he stands before you today. God, we just um, thank you for his heart, God, his heart of compassion, his heart, Lord, to achieve something with you, to be obedient to you. I pray that his faith in you would only strengthen day by day especially go, as he goes into a kind of a hostile, hard environment, um, that he would find you to be his solace, his peace and contentment. Mm -hmm. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen his resolve to serve you, Lord, even when faced with a lot of alternatives, God, and people who do not trust in you like he does. We ask you, Lord, as well, to be his strength emotionally and physically, God, as he undergoes the trials ahead of him. 
Lord, we thank you for this family that has just uh, wrapped their arms around him, for his origin, his family of origin. Uh, Lord, we thank you for all the people that influenced him to this point, this day. And we ask, Lord God, that he would find others uh, the of the like mind, mind, people, people who, who will also, also uh, wrap, wrap their, their arms, arms around him in, in a way and give him give strength, strength and provide a community that he so desperately needs. Lord, enrich, Lord, enrich his, his faith, faith, enrich his heart, heart give him strength. strength. We thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do continually, Lord Jesus, as he submits his heart and life to you. We pray these things in Jesus' precious and powerful name. Amen. So that's the beginning of uh, career. So uh, then we have an end. <laughs> Is that right, uh, Dave and Cindy? Is this your last Sunday? Is the rumor that I heard? You're not sure yet. Yeah, it, it might be our last. All right. Oh, you took my microphone way too quick, Louie. I'll, I'll give it back to you. That's fine. Well, face the folks. Don't face me. <laughs> Dave, do you have a story that you want to share with us today? <laughs> Really? Not really. <laughs> I would like to know who's, who's queer. <laughs> <coughs> well, I'm not going to look at anybody specifically. No, we're not, we're not really sure, but um, for me, that's all it may be. But what, what we are sure of is that this has gone through a change. You started down that road of naming names. You can't quit now. You got to work. You got to work the room, man. You make that kind of mistake, you're gonna pay. I had the speech. Just got. You got to know. Got to. Had my speech written on a gum wrapper, which I forgot. <laughs> Very short speech, right? Every single person in this room loves so much. And I'm so pleased to be here with you. But you know the Lord has something for us in Virginia. And if that's only to be um, the face and the love of God for my daughter and her friends and her children. And the support from them. Um, in a world that needs our love. We do want to love you, Lord, so much. And we thank you all for any of us praying for us um, being our friends and we feel the joy of being part of this church. We thank you all. And if not, may God bless you richly in all you say to do. Thank you. Amen. Um, Marie, <laughs> yeah, Marie Zomek is in back of us and Rich is up there. I, there's no way I could forget them. We worked with them a lot here, and the, they are a treasure to this church. Yeah. yeah. Where are you going? We got to pray for you. <laughs> so, uh, board, I need you up here, and everybody else stand. And raise your hand and face it toward them.
anybody else wants to join, it's a free-for-all. This prayer thing, it's a free-for-all. Joanne, don't force people to pray. That's inappropriate. The girls are here. Yeah. A little prayer meeting. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this special couple. Thank you, Lord. Let me pray your prayers. Would you pray for them specifically? Minister strength, Lord Jesus. Minister wholeness to them. Lord, touch their family where they're going. The kids, Lord Jesus. The grandkids. God, what a great opportunity. Lord, set them in place with their family again. Jesus, do a remarkable work in them as friends, new friends for a new community of faith. Help them in the neighborhood that they live in, Lord, to be effective friends, Lord, and neighbors to those that they live around. Jesus, provide for them financially, provide for them spiritually, provide for them emotionally, Lord. Do something unique, Lord Jesus, at this phase in their ministry, in this phase of their life, Lord Jesus. Continue, God, to give them work to do, the pleasure of ministry, Lord God. Build their strength, Lord Jesus, to meet every challenge, every challenge, Lord Jesus. We trust you to them. We give them, Lord, to you. And know we'll always be together, Lord Jesus. Thank you for what you're about to do in their lives and what they've meant to this church and these people. What a blessing. What a blessing and a hand they have been. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, guys. Let's use this opportunity to just continue to stand and tell everybody hello in the congregation and that you love them and you have a check for them at the end of the service. <laughs>
lady that's visiting today from South Carolina. Her name is Sandy. I think so. Shelley. Starts with an S. Susan. Samantha. Just a couple of reminders. Uh, tonight is a prayer meeting at 6. Glory. Woo. Huh. Second Sunday of every month we get together for prayer. And um, so I'll be here at 6. I'll be lonely this afternoon if you want to come by. I think I'm going to do some more painting in the basement for those of you that are excited about that. Uh, but anyway, <coughs> I digress. Uh, so we'd love for you to join us at 6 o'clock for prayer. Um, the Lord is doing some incredible things in our church, and it Amen. starts with prayer. Amen. Uh, membership opportunities still open. We've got three so far that have expressed an interest, and uh, if you'd like to, like to explore that, we have uh, an application, simple application we can even hand you today. You can talk about it with me. And uh, then we'll go through the process. We're looking for a day in the next few weeks to meet together after Sunday for just a, a little session to understand better what membership means and the opportunities in front of you. So see me today. Window is closing, although until we set a date, it's still open. Also on uh, the weekend of July 3rd, um, Teen Challenge will be visiting us for... And, uh, and inspiration so we'll also be following that with a picnic and i understand there's something going around asking you to make with pickles and peppers gentlemen join us in the front for a prayer for our tithe and offering support boy i'm having trouble with my mic today it's phasing out. Eli told Eli told me this particular this particular frequency is now illegal to use in church, and uh, so the government must be uh, the FCC must be punishing us for continuing <laughs> to use this old mic at this old frequency. But um, <clears throat> until Eli gets me a new mic, I'll continue to use this FCC unapproved mic. Please do not report me to the federal government. <laughs> Just to, you're bound to report me, aren't you? <laughs> I hope they watch the sermons. At least they'll get something out of it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that your mercies are new every single morning. And we are so grateful, Lord. We're not grateful enough, frankly, because sometimes the mornings that we recognize your new mercies are sometimes few and far between. Mm -hmm. Forgive us, Lord, for ignoring, ignoring such a great salvation, as the writer of Hebrews reminds us. We do not want to ignore you, Lord. We do not want to turn our face away with all of the blessings that surround us, Lord. So God, today, we uh, again, we give joyfully, we give gratefully, we give sincerely to you, for you have done so much and continue to do so much in and through and around us. We are such a blessed people, and so God is a privilege to recognize the privilege of being a child of God, we give today. We bless you today, Lord. Bless gift and giver, I pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Mr. Murray. We have a couple Fitzgeralds on the stage today. Liz and Mike have. Uh, and we. A new citizen in the United States. So thank you for joining us on the team. Louise, uh, she went and uh, when was the when was the meeting in Lawrence? Monday. Monday. And when did you get the jury duty notice? Thursday. Thursday. Isn't that funny? You're not even sworn in yet? <laughs> yeah, well, let me tell you, the Bible speaks against swearing. Um, so uh, as far as it depends on you. That is so funny, though. I find it funny. Do you find it funny? I think you do. So, what does the word casual mean to you? The opposite of these suits that I wear every Sunday, probably. Casual used to mean wearing um, less formal clothes to work on Fridays, right? Casual Friday. Anybody remember Casual Friday? <clears throat> and then COVID hit. And uh, so there's no more Casual Fridays because every day is casual. So uh, we all went out and got, well, we didn't have to go out and get any. We had the old sweatpants and T-shirts for work and, and a headset, and we're off and running. Casual. Uh, says that casual means happening by chance. Casual means without definite or serious intention. Careless, offhand, in passing. Casual is an indifference to what's happening. Eh. Apathy, unconcern. In other words, whatever. Casual, whatever. Things that are unplanned, spontaneous, offhand, something that we're indifferent or unconcerned about. Casual. Take it or leave it. Have you ever thought about the way you relate to God? Have you ever used the word whatever? in describing your relationship to God. Whatever. Whatever. You know, God's grace is rich and deep, and God loves me no matter what I do, what I say, if I ever show up or whatever. God loves me. He knows me. Have you ever thought about you and God as casual acquaintances? You know? We have casual acquaintances that Every once in a while, we see their name on Facebook. You know, that according to the algorithm, their name slips in for one day. And we see a, a post from them. Oh, I wonder how they're doing. Haven't talked to them in years. Oh, casual. Today, we're looking at chapter 4 in Hebrews. And uh, I just have to say that Hebrews presents something much different than casual approaches to God, a casual relationship with God. For instance, our primary text could be taken from verse 11 of chapter 4. It says, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. We're going to unpack this a little bit. So that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. I know I pulled that out of context. The, the phrase, of course, is make every effort. Make every effort. Make an effort. What does it mean to make an effort, and what does the author mean by entering God's rest? Let's see if we can figure it out. Take your notes out. Does everybody have the notes in front of them? 
Yeah. Hebrews chapter 4, we'll start with verse 1, go to 13. Therefore, now, therefore is there because it's following something else. So there is for a reason. Since we presented some other material, the author says, since the promise of entering his rest, God's rest still stands, let us be careful that none of us be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the gospel preached to us, all of us in this room, just as they did in the desert, but the message they heard in the desert was of no value to them, because those who heard did not combine it with faith. Faith. Now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God had said, so I declared on my oath, on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. We enter that rest because we have believed. Yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. For spoken about the seventh day in these words. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. Remember where we find that? Genesis, right. It's in the Genesis story. And again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. It still remains, that's the book of Numbers and Exodus. Shall never enter my rest. We're going to look at that in a second. Verse 6, it still remains that some will enter that rest, and those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. So we've got those who did enter the rest because of their obedience, and those who didn't enter the rest because of their disobedience. Therefore, God again set a certain day, calling it today, when a long time later he spoke through David, who wrote Psalm 95, and used this phrase, among others, Today, if you hear God's voice, do not harden your hearts. We've already heard that phrase a couple of times in chapter 3 of Hebrews. Today, if you hear his voice, God's voice, don't harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God, you and I. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Does, that does not mean that if you enter God's rest, you can just enter permanent retirement at that point. This is not that, that thing. So don't get too excited here. I mean, should you get excited? It's the word of, never mind. Then we get, come to the text here. Let us therefore, based on what's come before in this chapter, make every effort to enter that rest. Make every effort so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. All right, the people in the desert died because of their disobedience. They did not follow God's voice. They didn't mix it with faith. In other words, they didn't believe in God enough to obey. So we don't, the author here says, make every effort to enter, enter that rest. Don't fall like they did. And then he goes, he shifts gears. And we pull this next two verses right out of the Bible and we use it for everything. And it's appropriate use. But he just shifts gears and he says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The word of God, the word of God exposes, exposes the reality of who we are inside. So let's look back on last week. Before we move through these verses in detail, I want to underline a couple, from last, a couple things from last week that will help remain and kind of cement our perspective today. So I mentioned the word therefore is pointing back to chapter 3. The low points of chapter 3 were the following. 
the writer or sermon giver uses a negative example of his wandering ancestors from Exodus, the book of Exodus. These people in the desert disobeyed God's instructions and ended up not entering the promised land called Canaan. They got right up to the, to the, to the, um, uh, the new country, promised 400 and some years earlier, probably 600 years earlier by Abraham, their ancestor. God promised Abraham, their ancestor, all the land of Canaan, all the land that he traveled through. God promised all that land to the, to the Israelites. They went through 430 years of hell in Egypt. And they came out right on the precipice after about a year and a half year and three months, somewhere in there. They were right on the precipice of entering this land promised to them. It was called the Promised Land, or Canaan in the language of the day. They sent in 12 spies, remember? We talked about this last week. They sent in 12 spies. And those spies came back with a good report about what they saw, but a terrifying report about what they thought about what they saw. Specifically, the writer says the people of Israel suffered hardened hearts because what they did with those spies' lies, the lies of the spies, was they said, we can't go any further. We're going to go back to Egypt, among other options. Okay, we just can't. We're not going to do this. This is not a good idea. The people are too tall. We're too weak that they'll just massacre us. They'll decimate us. The land is rich. The land absolutely meets all the qualifications for planting all of us in a wonderful area. But we can't do it. We can't do it. As much as Moses and God and Joshua and Caleb and, and all the people, as much as all the people listening to God tell us, we can't go there. And so they believed the lies instead of the word of God. And they suffered for it. They hardened their hearts. The condition they suffered from, we talked about last week, was sin's deceitfulness. In other words, believing lies that created wrong actions. Believing lies that create wrong actions. Last week we talked about Adam and Eve and their lies that they believed about God, God's only prohibition in the garden, and and they, they said, yeah, it sounds plausible to us when they heard the serpent give them different information, a different perspective. They said, yeah, it seems like God's holding back on us. I'm not sure what the deal is, but this really looks like good food, you know, and it's different. It's different from the other trees. So let's, you know, come on, Adam. I'll eat first, and that, because you're a little, you know, you're a little shy. They believed the lies in the garden, and it cost us even today. In the case of the Israelites poised to enter the promised land in Numbers 14, God made it very clear that an entire generation would die in the desert because of their unbelief, because of their hardened hearts. They believed the lies of the spies. They came back with a fearful report instead of seizing on the words of God and trusting in him. And the irony is that God had done so much to bring them to that point. So many miracles that none of them had an explanation for. Why would God stop doing miracles in this people when, when God had done so much already? Why, why would you not believe God would help you going forward based on all the stuff God brought you out of? Egypt was one of the most powerful nations on the earth at that point in history. One of the most powerful, rich in resources country in all the earth. And, and, and God delivered 1.5 to 2 million people, kids included, the whole thing, and brought them, brought them through a desert, through a desert climate, gave them laws to live by, gave them water to drink, food, etc., brought them to this place, and yet... Who's God? We don't believe in God. Who's Moses? We don't believe. He hears from God. Just forget it. This is stupid. This is really stupid.
from Hebrews 3, prescription, solution for a hardened heart. Number one, he said, guard your heart. Cultivate a healthy one. Keep your heart soft toward God. Cultivate a healthy heart. Stay connected to God so your thoughts reflect God's thoughts. Guard your heart. It's the wellspring of life, Proverbs says. And number two, the other thing is encourage daily. Encourage each other daily. I think this is a, an important point to remember from Hebrews 3 that part of the solution for not having a hardened heart is to lean on each other, to encourage each other. This was never meant to be a solo journey. This has always been meant to be, well, a body, a, a communion of people, a community of people, always. And that's why the lies were so damaging because it went from hardened heart to hardened heart through the ear. Everybody started believing this, this community-related sin, this lie, this deceitfulness. But what the writer of Hebrews is saying, one of the solutions for keeping your heart, hard, your heart soft and for not listening to the lies is to encourage one another with the truth. In other words, if the lie can spread, so can the truth, so can the encouragement, so can the love that's necessary, so can the encouragement that God's going to bring us through. God's not done with us. God will not leave us nor forsake us. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If we can remember to encourage one another, we can make it. And of course, the last thing that we hammered on last week was to fix our thoughts on Jesus, to hold on, to endure. Don't quit. In other words, don't be casual. Make every effort. Make every effort. So let me look at the first three verses with you very quickly and kind of take it up. Put it all back together here in a couple minutes. First three verses. Since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of us be found to have fallen short of the rest. For we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value because they did not combine it with faith. One of the things we have to define today that was mentioned in both last week's chapter and this week's is what is the rest of God? Not the remainder of God, because we've only seen a portion. But what is the rest, the rest, the Sabbath of God? We'll do that in a minute. But the, the place to start here is to realize that whatever that rest is, we, the readers, listeners of the writer's message, can enter into it for ourselves. It is a goal of ours. It is a realized goal if we'll make an effort to enter it. The door's not shut. We can enter it. We must enter it, though, through faith and belief in the Lord. And remember, it's all about today. Today and every day. Because today just keeps popping up in the Whether it's chapter 3 or chapter 4. It's on, wow, I'm really cutting out. Going in. It's not your fault, Rick. So today is this, is the, the implication today is, well, today, and then there's another today, next day, and then the following today, then day after that. Today is still there to enter into, and it's encouraged every day is that today. It is a present day. So the lesson for us, according to the writer of Hebrews here, is be careful to combine the promise of rest with faith today. The Israelites in the desert heard the promise of the land ahead of them. They didn't believe. They didn't trust. They treated the voice of God with disdain, with disrespect, with a casual whatever response. So God got angry, and here's what he said. 
How long will this wicked community grumble against me? I've heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites, so tell them, speaking to Moses, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very things I heard you say. See, the people in the desert were complaining to God that God was going to kill them in the desert. They kept complaining. So God said, I'm going to bring your prophecy to fruition. In the desert, your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who was counted in the census and who's grumbled against me. Not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb, Caleb son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun, the two spies that didn't lie. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will surely do these things to this whole wicked community which is banded together against me. They will meet their end in this desert. Here they will die. Now, let me ask you this. Even people that rebelled against him, even people that rejected him, that didn't live by faith, did he feed them and clothe them and give them water for 40 more years? It, it reminds me of Jesus calling Judas Iscariot to be one of his disciples. Right? Just, why, why would you, Jesus, why would you do that? Why, why would you do that? Why would you bring him close? Why would God, who had been rejected by this people, continue to provide for them as they wandered around the, in the desert? I think part of it is that whole thing of God not, in, not wanting people to... God wants people to be saved, to be delivered, to be set free, but God still is seeking that they would respond in some way. The writer of Hebrews is saying this can happen to us if we're not careful. If we don't combine our hearing of God's promises, God's voice with faith, we will suffer that same fate. We won't be able to enter that rest. In Genesis 2, it's the Sabbath rest of God. In, in the book of Joshua, the man who eventually led the new generation to the promised land entered into the land of rest. The, the, the writer says, and I quote very quickly, Louise, can I borrow your mic again? You do too? Wow. Uh, this goes to go you. Don't quote people you don't know. So, no. So anyway, as I was, uh, I was saying, there is another rest that's coming for those who trust in God, who believe in God. And today... And every day is today. We have an opportunity to enter that rest. So let's define what that rest is. When we think of rest, we think of a casual, laid-back day on the beach. We think of of uh, uh, Ron, and and uh, we 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 just think of the Van Burens on a cruise, because that's all they do, really. They work for three months and go on a cruise. <laughs> Work for another three months and go on a cruise. Maybe that's what it means, a rest. Maybe it, maybe it means a, a place, a time without structure where we sleep till noon and watch sitcoms for the rest of the day. You know, watch Friends for 17 hours. 
We translate rest in a lot of ways, but the biblical record, whether in the story of creation where God rested or the, you know, the Sabbath rest of the Ten Commandments, the Day of Atonement in the law, it's about something different than a great night's sleep and an unstructured day. The land of rest to which the author calls the hearers has more to do with a spiritual state of right relationship and blessing from God. Rest. Contentment. Peace. Rest, contentment, peace. This promise holds vast implications for physical and emotional well-being, but the beginning place must be with our spiritual condition. Because if our spiritual condition is at rest and peace, it will make its way to our physical and emotional condition. Can I hear an amen? Jesus, the new Joshua, who leads God's people successfully into a new land of rest, remember? He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you may be with me also. A place of rest. Jesus said this when he was walking on the earth, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. What's a yoke? It's a mechanism that, that, that binds two beasts together. Binds two beasts together. In this case, it binds Jesus to us. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Just as a, a, young, a young animal would learn from an older animal what to do, how to do it, how fast to go, they're yoked together to do the work of the farm, just as that would happen, so we also learn from our elder brother. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. As he looks out on a desert wandering humanity, his solution is come to me. Come to me. As, as he looks out at us today, as he looks out on the crowds today, the people in our community. He's not saying come to a set of teachings. Although Jesus does call us to that as well. He's not specifically saying come to your therapist. Although God can use gifted counselors. He's not saying come to a much needed vacation. Although an evaluation of our tendencies to be workaholics and a reassessment of our life priorities may be in order, rather, Jesus is saying, come to me. You need rest. I promised you rest. Come to me and I will provide you rest. Jesus offers the ultimate source of true rest, for true rest is found only in a right relationship with the person of God. The rest is his rest for his people found by obeying his word. True rest is rightly relating to God through faith and obedience to his word. So let me just give you a definition of rest for us today. The rest of God is being, stepping into the presence of God. It's just what it is. The rest of God. That's why Hebrews 3.1 said to his readers, fix your thoughts on Jesus. Don't take your eyes off Jesus. Don't let yourself drift away. Don't believe the lies. Don't fail to step out and move forward in what God is calling you to do. Make every effort to enter that rest. Make every effort to Enter God's presence to be with Jesus. Make an effort.
You know, there's a constant theological struggle between the book of James that's all about, well, balancing faith with works, and then the writer of Galatians that's all about, all about grace. So we have, it's just by grace we have been saved, not through works, lest any man should boast. But then James comes along and says, unless you show me works to go with your grace, grace is insufficient, grace is not completed. You know, we have this constant toggle between is it God's gift of grace to us, is it our works? The truth is that we must make an effort not to produce religious activity, but to be with Jesus. So it's not about working for God. It's not about serving in children's ministry or being an usher or even a preacher or whatever we do in the church. It doesn't matter. That, that stuff doesn't count. Being with Jesus is the reason we meet. Being with Jesus together is the reason we meet. It's the reason we exist to receive from Jesus what to do in this world, especially for those around us. And then in, in, in verse 12, the writer of Hebrews seems to just take a right turn. It's just like a screaming, just one of those, you know, you see in an action movie where they're driving this way and all of a sudden they fast and furious to the left or the right. Here, the writer talks about the Word of God being a sword. The uses of the sword imagery for the Word of God happens at several places in the New Testament. I gave you a few. In Ephesians 16, the Word of God is referred to as the sword of the Spirit. Revelation 1, 2, 19, the sharp sword proceeds from the mouth of the Son of God, this dynamic spoken word from Jesus. In this Hebrews passage, the sword is a sharp word of discernment which penetrates the darkest corners of our existence. That phrase, everything will be laid bare and uncovered, is the word hymnos or gymnos, which normally communicates nakedness. That's the Grecian bath influence. It also refers to being helpless and unprotected. In this passage, God's word is the sword, says everything about us, but especially our motives, our belief in the lies, are completely exposed to God through his words, that we can't hide anything from his gaze. For those who have stopped short of entering God's rest are spiritually naked. They can't hide anything. But like the story of the emperor's new clothes, we have a choice to make in that naked state as the word of God is applied to us. I know that's a weird use of that story, but what are we going to do about it? Will we believe the lies or heed the voice of Jesus? Will we know that we'll, we will know we're completely exposed, but what will we do about that? Will we heed the voice of Jesus or believe the lies? You know, we tend to think of great faith in terms of following God and the accomplishing of great deeds somewhere else in the world or overcoming great obstacles, and those can certainly be definitions of great faith. Yet, true faith begins with a face-to-face -face encounter with God, and we never move very far from His presence because it's always today, and His rest is available always today. Today's challenge, every day's challenge, is to make every effort to enter God's presence where we find rest. Where we find rest. Stand with me. A little bit long today, I'm sorry. Bow your head with me today.
Lord, I pray that you'll give us courage to uh, use the truth of this admonition today from the writer of Hebrews to choose to enter your rest, to reject the lies of the enemy, to reject the voices of so many that are trying to get our attention and pull us away from rest, true rest found in Jesus. Lord, we need you. We need you above all others. And sometimes you in place of all others. You're the only one that has true answers for our lives. You're the only one who is truth himself. You're the only one, Lord, that can really give us guidance and certainly the one that gives us life, su supernatural life, eternal life, physical life, spiritual life. You're the life giver. Without you, where could we turn? Who would we be? Who would we be? Who would we be? I gave you an action step on your notes today. Make every effort today, every day, which is today, make every effort to step into God's presence. So we've done a lot of stuff today. I have to ask you, have you entered God's presence today yet? Personally, privately, verbally, emotionally, physically, through your word, through your obedience. It's there that you find God's rest. It's there that you find what you desperately are looking for, God's rest today. Now, it would be easy for me to just dismiss you because there's coffee and there's conversation. But I don't want to dismiss you just quite yet. I'd like to give you an opportunity to move toward the Lord today. Maybe one more time. Maybe for the first time. I don't know. This wasn't a very complex sermon, but it's a really powerful moment action that you must take. I trust you will take. So I don't know I don't know if that means moving from where you are and standing in the aisle or at the front or kneeling or sitting back down. I don't know what it is. It's uh, it's five till noon and that's usually late for us. But you know Five minutes with Jesus. Can you do it? Five minutes with Jesus? Five minutes with Jesus. Amen. 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 Let's take five minutes with Jesus.